think about the last time that you were rushing to get out the door. Maybe you were running late for work or to meet a friend, (laughs) trying to get to where you're going and get there on time. But is it just me or are those also the exact times that you end up smudging your mascara, spilling your coffee, hitting all the red lights? (laughs) For some reason, the more I rush the more slowed down I get by the randomest, silliest things, and they only end up leaving me even more frustrated. And on top of that, I generally don't arrive that much earlier (laughs) than I would have had I not rushed. I don't know about you, but when I get into my car and I turn on my GPS and Siri says that it's going to take me 22 minutes to get to where I'm going, I make it my personal mission to make it in 18 minutes. I have a whole superiority complex around beating the time the GPS tells me that it's going to take to get somewhere. And I don't know what it is. And truthfully, this isn't necessarily safe, but it's also not a healthy or productive way to live your life. I mean, we do this rushing in small ways and also in big ways, like when it comes to processing or lack of processing our emotions. We tell ourselves, you need to get over it, move on. Why is it taking me so long? Why am I feeling like this? Why am I so tired all the time? I should be this. I should be doing more of that. And all of these stories that we tell ourselves where we limit the time that we have, even though you have time, It's just a matter of, are you willing to spend that time on yourself, trusting that time is going to expand to accommodate for everything that's important? Or are you going to rob yourself of your precious time for the sake of giving it to somebody else? And I get that sometimes we don't have the privilege or luxury of telling our bosses or teachers that I need more time to complete this thing. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't, you know, meet deadlines or be a reliable human being. But I think that the more we rush and push ourselves to go faster through life, the more we actually end up stunting our growth and getting stuck in minutia and really focusing on these nitty-gritty unimportant things like beating the GPS estimated time of arrival instead of getting to where I'm going safely. And I think this is a huge metaphor for life because if we want inner peace, we must slow the fuck down. Slow the fuck down. I wish I could make this the title of this episode, but I was afraid that it would get flagged on the internet. So we went with the power of slowing down in a modern society where our lives are a lot about having more and doing more and being more. I think this more, and I think we all know this, it tends to congest our lives and actually limit us. Pressing pause is a powerful way to play. I hope you can notice the allegory in that pressing pause, like on the TV, is also a powerful way to play because when you pause, you breathe, and when you breathe, you harness your power. I think the power of the pause is underestimated and underused, and it's also very misunderstood because there's a lot of misconceptions that go with it, right? Like, for example, the negative connotations behind pausing, especially when it comes to like taking a break and uh, resting, we think that if we pause, we're stopping, right? And we associate stopping as giving up and being a failure. I used to have a friend who would say, Mary, (laughs) rest before you're tired. You have to rest before you're tired. I played pickleball four times last week and my hips and ankles were hurting. And I'm thinking to myself, like, if only I had just taken one day off and played three times, it's not an addiction, it's an obsession. The pickleball cult, I'm in the pickle cult in case you're in it too. Can we please talk about that? Because I'm obsessed with pickleball lately, but it's also uh, something that I feel in my body, you know, and I think you need to be like properly warmed up and, and 
do the exercises for injury prevention. And I started reading articles about like how to prevent injury in pickleball because it is the fastest growing injury in the U.S. And one of the top things that physical therapists are saying is just don't play as much. Allow your body to recover in between the times that you play. This goes for any sport. It's better to pause and take a break before you get the injury or before you're utterly exhausted and burnt out and are forced to take a break by your body. It's better to just be proactive about your rest. Pausing doesn't mean you're stopping. It just means you're taking a break. A pause allows you the time to process, to connect, to heal, you know, your body, your spirit, your mind, and you're also tapping into intuition and focus and direction. You are not going to hear what your intuition is telling you to do. There are so many answers, so many solutions that could probably come to us rather organically, but we just don't have the time and silence to hear what that inner guidance is telling us. Our intuition steers us in a direction that logic and reasoning sometimes can't justify. Um, You know, I've historically, ever since I was a kid, struggled with sleep in that interest with like sleep science and, and improving the quality of sleep. I also uh, dabble in like dreaming and lucid dreaming in particular. What are we doing this one third of our lives that is so important for brain health, for cognition? Talk about pausing. I mean, a sleep is literally like a mini death that we do every day. Like our, our conscious brain literally has to turn off in order to regenerate and there's just some insane research done on the importance of sleep and how like if you miss a night of sleep that's like the equivalent of doing a bunch of drugs or I don't know sometimes scientists can get a little bit weird with their comparisons and analogies but regardless I think we all know sleep is so much more important than the post-industrial world has has allowed it to be and what was I saying about that Oh, dreaming. Okay. So dreams are also very important though, though not a lot of scientists have uncovered like what dreaming actually actually is and why it happens to us like from an evolutionary perspective, like what's the benefit of dreams. What I have received from, you know, the little bits and pieces of information I've gathered about dream science is that uh, dreaming is basically your brain processing by piecing together unlikely events, elements, uh, people that you've encountered, just piecing everything together in a hodgepodge of, you know, like a random scenario situation. I mean, we all know how weird dreams can be, but when your brain is doing that, it's also tapping into its utmost creativity. That's why after a good night's rest, you wake up with like this sense of clarity and peace and like the thing you cried yourself to sleep about the night before isn't as bad as you thought it was at 11 p.m. You know, those hours are not only regenerative, but they also let your brain, if you're in deep REM sleep, which is where you have to be in order to dream, your dreams will present to you a certain perspective, a certain way of looking at things that you, in your conscious awake state, simply cannot tap into because we're we're too logical we're too busy we don't we don't even let ourselves daydream and that's why at night dreaming getting good sleep resting there's many different layers to the benefits of it slowing down is how our intuition can be expressed and a perfect example of that is sleeping and the dream state that we tend to, if you're lucky, I mean, I have pretty vivid dreams, but not all the time. I always feel extra accomplished when I have funky dreams because I'm like, oh, my brain is coming up with some cool new things, even though it makes no sense to me right now. But something is happening that we don't fully know yet. Even scientists don't know. Don't always rely on logic and reasoning and, you know, this thing about multitasking and getting everything done 
sometimes it's okay to not get something done for the sake of slowing down and taking your time with something important, something that actually matters to you, something that's going to make a difference in in your goals and your your well-being. Here are some small ways that you can practice slowing down and I think that this also has a um, external benefit, like a side benefit of building your self-confidence. Walk slower than you usually do. If you want to appear more confident, practice walking slowly. Confident people don't rush. Confident people take their time and space, right? What does walking slowly let you do? You're not only taking time to get to wherever you're walking to, but you're also taking up physical space. This builds confidence. Um, It also allows you to really be seen. I think a good place to practice this is in a cafe. Um, If you're, you know, walking up to the barista, kind of like walk through the door, put your phone down, lift your eyes, and like slowly walk to where you're going. It's actually really empowering. You can also slow down your speaking by taking a breath in between each sentence. And one thing that's really hard for me to do, especially on this podcast, this podcast is not only me practicing, but also a very humbling experience because once I turn on the microphone, I get a little bit nervous and sweaty and then I start rambling, but I try to tell myself to put a period at the end of a thought. 